Beauty's Revenge by Nigel Hinton. On an island in the middle of the sea, a long way from anywhere, a small beaver was rocking up and down on a swing. His name was Baby Bee. If you could have looked down on the island at that moment, you would have shouted, Look out, Baby Bee! There's something horrible coming just over the hill. Quick, run away! But you weren't there, so Baby Bee went on swinging happily. He'd been happy all day. His granddad, Mr. Edgar Beaver, had taken him to see their old friend, Mrs. Badger. They'd eaten a delicious lunch. Then the grown-ups had decided to have a little snooze. So Baby Bee went into the garden to have a swing. He loved to swoop up and down as high as he could. And while he was swinging, he always made up songs. Today's song went like this. Zoom, zoom, buzz, wee. I am flying like a bee. Zoom, zoom, buzz, why? I am being like a fly. Baby Bee stopped singing. Look at me, Robin, he shouted. I'm as high as this. And then he stopped. His mouth fell open with fright and his eyes nearly popped out of his head. Something that looked like a huge brown snake was wriggling down the hill behind Mrs. Badger's house. It was moving very fast, nearer and nearer, and it was enormous. Already its head was near the house, and its body stretched all the way back to the top of the hill. Suddenly, the head of the snake came round the side of the house and started moving across the grass towards the tree. As it came nearer, Baby Bee saw that it wasn't a snake at all. Something was pushing the earth up out of the ground. Help! It's an earthquake! He shouted. The tree began to tremble and there was a horrible hissing and rumbling. Baby Bee hung onto the swing and squeezed his eyes shut. A nasty smell like bad eggs and drains floated up to his nose. The noise faded away and the shaking stopped. Baby Bee's heart was beating fast and the horrible smell was making him feel sick. When he opened his eyes, the long line of earth stretched right underneath the swing and away into the forest behind him. He jumped off the swing and started running to Mrs. Badger's house. Suddenly, he felt something wet and squelchy under his feet. He stopped and looked. Thousands of pink, slimy worms were wriggling and squirming their way up out of the earth. Help! Wigglers! shouted Baby Bee, and he jumped and hopped and skipped his way to Mrs. Badger's front door. He burst into the parlour, shouting and screaming, Wake up! Wake up! It's an earthquake or a wilderness! Look out! They're coming! He jumped into Mrs. Badger's lap and hid his head under her apron. Mrs. Badger and Mr. Edgar woke up with a start. Oh, what? Hey, what? mumbled Mr. Edgar. Oh, Baby Bee, what are you doing? said Mrs. Badger. Baby Bee couldn't speak. Baby Bee, stop this silliness, said Mrs. Badger, and she lifted him off her lap and stood him on the floor. He still couldn't speak, but he took Mr. Edgar's paw and pulled him to the door. Well, I'll be blowed, said Mr. Edgar, when he saw the long line of earth and the thousands of worms. It was an earthquake, Grandpa, Baby Bee said, finding his voice at last. I was just doing swinging, and I think it was a snake, and it tried to get me, but it missed. Then all of them wigglers came and started wiggling, and they were all squelchy when I treaded on them. Perhaps it was a mole, said Mrs. Badger. Mm, I don't think so. Mr. Edgar scratched his head. I wonder how far it stretches. Oh, what a horrible smell. Whatever it was, must have almost choked the worms. Look at the robin. He's never seen so much food in all his life. The robin was standing in the middle of the wiggling worms. He chose the fattest worm he could see. He picked it up in his beak and flew off to eat it in private. In less than a minute, he was back for another. Hold on, Sergeant Robin, Mr. Edgar said. I've got an important job for you to do. The robin looked sadly at all the tempting worms, then flew on to Mr. Edgar's shoulder. Now, listen, Sergeant. I want you to fly off and follow this line of earth. I must know where it comes from and where it goes. Understand? The robin bobbed to show that he knew what he had to do, then flew off. Well, said Mrs. Badger, while we're waiting, we may as well go inside and have a cup of something. Well, Mr. Edgar, what do you make of it all? asked Mrs. Badger when they'd finished their drinks and cake. 
Ah, said Mr. Edgar. Well, I don't want to say too much before I hear what the robins found out, but if it turns out to be what I think it is, I'm afraid we've got trouble on our paws. Mr. Edgar's voice was so serious that Baby Bee ran over to sit on Mrs. Badger's lap. Um, I, I'm not scared, he said. But he was. All the worms had gone down into the ground by the time the robin got back. He told them what he'd seen. The line of earth went from one side of the island to the other. It started near the manor where Baby Bee lived, then went past Mrs. Badger's house all the way to Mr. Edgar's castle, Beaver Towers. After that, it went straight towards the sea. At the edge of a high cliff, the line stopped. There was just a large hole where something had come out of the ground. So, said Mr. Edgar when the robin had finished, she didn't find what she was looking for. She? Who are you talking about? asked Mrs. Badger. Mr. Edgar took a deep breath and said quietly, I think we've had a visit from Oyen. What? Why did you think it was her? Baby Bee said. It was that horrible smell, mostly. It reminded me of the smell she left behind at Beaver Towers. It's a kind of smell that comes from the world of blackness. No wonder those poor worms had to come up for air. You're right, said Mrs. Badger. I knew I'd smelled it before. It was the night all those growlers jumped on the fire. They shivered as they remembered that night. The witch, Oyen, had come to try and capture Beaver Towers so that she could live there as queen. She had caught nearly all the animals, and she was going to make her growlers throw them on a big fire. Then, at the last moment, her plan had gone wrong. She had been called back to the world of blackness, and all the growlers had jumped onto the fire and died. Will the growlers come back? Baby Bee asked. No fear, said Mr. Edgar. But Oyen, Mrs. Badger whispered. Ah, oh, now, she's a different kettle of fish. She must still be furious about what happened. Witches don't like having their plans ruined. I dare say she'd like to get her evil claws on the person who stopped her from getting control of Beaver Towers. She was searching for Philip, Mrs. Badger said, and then looked at Mr. Edgar. I'm sure of it. I'm sure of it, too, Mr. Edgar said. Flip it! Baby Bee shouted and jumped up and down happily. Hooray for Philip! Even though he couldn't say his name properly, Philip was the best friend Baby Bee had ever had. The young boy had been brought to the island by mistake when one of Mr. Edgar's spells had gone wrong. It was he who had stopped Oyen and saved everyone from the fire and the growlers. When Philip had gone home again, Baby Bee had been very sad. Flip it's coming, Baby Bee shouted, and he's going to bonk Shilly O'Doyen on the head. Hooray! Shh, Baby Bee, your grandpa doesn't mean that Philip's coming. He means that Oyen has gone to look for him, said Mrs. Badger. Afraid so, and if she finds him, he's going to be in great danger because he rescued us. Baby Bee stopped jumping up and down and looked at his grandfather. Can't we rescue him? he said. Easier said than done, youngun, Mr. Edgar replied. Do it like you've done before, said Baby Bee. Send a cloud. Good idea, youngun. Mr. Edgar stood up. Get me coat, will you, Baby Bee? There's no time to lose. The thunderstorm started as soon as Philip left school. Lightning lit up the dark sky, and the thunder boomed and rumbled along the wet street. He ran until he got to the baker's shop. Now he was safe, Philip began to enjoy the storm. It was one of the best storms he'd ever seen. It was almost as wild as the one Oyen had sent, so that the growlers could attack Mrs. Badger's house. Oyen, the growlers, beaver towers. It all seemed so far away. He wished his mother and father would believe him about beaver towers. When he got back home from his adventures on the island, there had been terrible trouble. He'd been missing for three whole days, and his parents had been out of their minds with worry. As soon as he started to tell them what had happened, he knew how strange it must sound. Being carried off to an island on a kite, helping animals to fight horrible monsters called growlers, meeting a boy that looked just like him, and then finding out that it was really a witch. No wonder they hadn't believed him. They got angry and told him to stop telling lies. When the storm stopped, Philip left the doorway and walked home. It was late. He began to run. 
When he turned into his road, his father's car was parked outside the house. There was a boy standing next to the car. Philip wondered if it was one of his friends. He looked up and down the road carefully. There was no traffic, so he crossed. When he looked towards his father's car again, the boy had gone. Philip ran along the pavement to his house. He opened the garden gate and noticed a faint smell of something horrible. Perhaps the rain had blocked up the drains. He went round the side of the house and opened the kitchen door. His father and mother were sitting at the table. "You're late. Where have you been?" his mother asked, and she looked angry. Philip started to tell her about the storm. "We want the truth," his father said, standing up quickly and walking towards Philip. "It is the truth. It was a terrible storm, and I know about the storm. But what I want to know is why you weren't at school this afternoon." I was, Dad. Don't tell me lies," his father shouted. "I saw you in town. Now, what were you doing? It wasn't me. I was in school, honest. Philip, I want the truth. It is the truth. It is. Ask Miss Copple. She'll tell you. She read us a story, and then we did history.、Uh, it was all about the Romans. Ask Miss Copple. That's exactly what I will do. And if you're telling us lies like all that other stuff about witches and animals, I warn you. While his father went into the hall to phone, Philip stood in the kitchen. Well, man, that's extraordinary," his father said when he came back. "I'm sorry, Philip. Miss Copple says you were in school all afternoon. I, I can't understand it. That boy looked just like you. I'm sorry about the bad temper." His mother kissed Philip and said, "Oh well, let's forget all about it. You hop upstairs and change, and I'll make your favourite tea, pancakes." Philip ran upstairs and started to change. As his father, seeing a boy who looked, suddenly a cold shiver ran down his back. A boy who looked exactly like him. It was just like that horrible time in the library at Beaver Towers. A boy who looked just like him, but it hadn't been a real boy. It had been Owen. Philip felt weak as he remembered how the boy's face had melted and become the awful face of the witch. He was scared. Philip ran downstairs before he could become more scared. His mother was making the pancakes, and his father was out in the garden talking to Mister Tibbs next door. Well, a lot of strange things are going on today, his father said as he came in and sat at the table. Mister Tibbs has just shown me a big hole in his garden. It's so deep you can't see the bottom. Looks just as if something's pushed its way up out of the ground. As soon as Philip had finished his tea, he ran outside and climbed up the fence to look over into Mr. Tibbs' garden. And there was the hole, right in the middle of the lawn. Philip leaned over the fence as far as he could, and then noticed the horrible smell. And somehow it it reminded him of something. He went back inside to talk to his father, but he wasn't there. He's gone back to the office to do some work. He should have done this afternoon, his mother explained. Philip sat in the front room and tried to read his comic, but he kept thinking about the smell. Where had he smelt it before? It was. It came to him in a flash, and he dropped the comic in fright. It was the smell of Owen. He ran into the kitchen, shouting, "Mum, Mum, what is it? It's Owen. It's what? Owen, you know the witch, the one I told you about. She came to Beaver Towers, and Philip, stop it." But mum, it's true, and that boy dad saw wasn't me; it was her. Philip was shouting, and he could feel tears of fear filling his eyes. His mother grabbed his shoulders and shook him. Stop that nonsense at once, Philip! I've told you before not to keep on telling those lies. The telephone rang, and his mother let go of him and went to answer it. Philip looked out of the kitchen window. His mother came back into the room. That was Mrs. Jessop on the phone. She is not very well, and she's asked me to go over there and do a few things for her. Philip watched his mother as she put her coat on. Can I come, Mum? I'd rather you didn't, Philip. You know how ill she is. She doesn't want any noise. Philip followed her to the front door. She pulled the door closed behind her. He was all alone in the house. He wanted to cry. He bolted the front door and ran through into the kitchen and locked the back door too. He was just about to sit at the table when something scratched on the back door. He froze and waited. Scratch, scratch. There it was again. Scratch, scratch. Something was trying to get in from the garden. The scratching came again, followed by a bark. 
That wasn't Owen. It sounds like Meg's. He ran to the door and unlocked it. Meg's bounded into the room, wagging her tail. Philip stood up and locked the door again. Philip got up and crept over to the window. He pulled the curtain a bit and looked out. The street was empty, just a few parked cars down the road. <coughs> Philip nearly jumped out of his skin as the telephone rang. He stepped back and trod on Meg's paw. The poor dog yelped and ran across the room. Sorry, girl. Sorry, Meg's. He said, and he patted her gently as he walked to the phone. Perhaps it was his mother or his father. He went into the hall and picked up the phone. Hello, he said. There was a silence at the other end. Hello, he said again. Still, no one spoke, and he suddenly became afraid. He knew who it was. Oyen. He could almost feel her evil coming out of the phone. He slammed it down. His knees were shaking. She had rung to make sure he was there. She was coming. Somewhere outside, she was already coming towards the house. Meg's was at the window barking at something outside. Philip peeked through the curtains. An old lady was standing on the other side of the road, looking straight at the house. She was dressed in a long black coat that went all the way down to her feet. A big black hat was pulled down over her eyes, and the whole face was in shadow. She stepped off the pavement, and the light shone on her face. Philip gasped. It was Owen. Philip dashed out to the front room and up the stairs. At the top of the stairs, he stopped and looked down at the front door. He heard the garden gate creak open. There was a long pause. Then the knocker banged on the door. Slowly, the letter box opened. Philip held his breath and pressed himself against the wall. Long, bony fingers started to come through the letter box. They moved around like the legs of a spider. Owen was trying to reach the lock. The whole hand was there now. Then the wrist. Then a thin arm twisting and tapping its way towards the lock. Philip ran into his bedroom and closed the door. There wasn't even a lock on this door. He pulled the bed round and pushed it hard up against the door. Then he looked for something else, the chair. His dragon kite was on it. He put the huge kite on the floor, then grabbed the chair and put it at the top of the bed. There was a click from downstairs, and he heard the front door open. Owen was in the house. Suddenly, there was a loud tap at the window. Philip spun round, expecting to see Owen, but it was the dragon kite. It had left the floor and was knocking against the window as if it wanted to get out. Philip dashed to the window and pulled the kite away. What was happening? He looked up and saw it—the little round cloud, Mister Edgar's magic cloud. There it was, bobbing up and down just above the window. The kite was pulling hard. It wanted to get out. It wanted to fly off with the cloud, and Philip could go with it. It would take him to Beaver Towers like last time. He would be safe. Quietly, Philip swung the window open. The kite pulled and tugged, and he had to hold it tight. It was so big that he'd have to slide it out on its side. He pushed the window some more, and it banged loudly against the outside wall. There was a the sound of footsteps running up the stairs. His feet left the window sill, and he closed his eyes. He heard a horrible scream as Owen burst into the room. Then he felt himself rushing up and up. When he opened his eyes. The whole town was just a group of twinkling lights below him. He was safe. In less than an hour, Philip caught sight of the islands. There was the large one that looked like the letter N, and by its side was the small one that looked like an O. The kite began to glide down towards the large island, and there, standing on a rock, was Beaver Towers. I'm back. Philip shouted as the kite glided in a big circle round the castle, and then below him he saw Mrs. Badger's house at the edge of the forest. Wee! Philip yelled in excitement as the kite dived towards the garden. When he was nearly touching the ground, Philip let go. He looked up and saw the kite and the cloud already flying away. Philip! A funny little voice squeaked from behind him. Philip turned round, and there was Baby Bee high on his swing. 
As he ran towards the tree, Philip could see what Baby Bee was going to do. Oh, no, Baby Bee! He shouted, don't jump! But it was too late. The little beaver had let go of the swing and was flying through the air, shouting, Philip! Philip held out his arms, but Baby Bee was coming too fast. The next moment he was lying on the grass with all the wind knocked out of him. Oh, 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 he said, rubbing his tummy. Crumbs, said Baby Bee, rubbing his head. Your tummy isn't half hard, Philip. But so's your head, Baby Bee. When they calmed down a bit, they went into the house. Baby Bee explained that Mrs. Badger and Mr. Edgar had gone to wait for Philip at Beaver Towers. But I knowed you all come here, Baby Bee said. How did you all know I was coming? asked Philip. Easy. Grandpa sended the cloud, because I saw Odin and she was an earthquaker. Philip got Baby Bee to sit down quietly and explain it all slowly. I understand, said Philip at the end. Baby Bee was asleep in his chair when Philip saw the robin land on the apple tree. Philip ran out to the cottage door, and the robin flew onto his shoulder and pressed his warm feathers against his neck. Hello, Robin, Philip said. I'm so glad to see you again. Is Mr. Edgar coming? The robin bobbed and flew off towards the fields. Philip followed him to the end of the garden and saw Mr. Edgar's old open car coming along the path from the forest. Mr. Edgar was sitting in the driving seat and Mrs. Badger was by his side. Philip could see the three head dogs who always pushed the car and he could hear them shouting, Heave! Ho! The car made a sudden swerve away from the house and rolled gently into a large tree. A very shaken Mrs. Badger tottered out of the car. Mrs. Badger gave Philip a little kiss on his cheek, then limped towards the house. Oh, well, sighed Mr. Edgar. Good heavens, where are the mechanics? Philip found the three hedgehogs rolled up into balls behind the car. With a little coaxing, he got them to unroll. Hello, Mick. Hello, Anne. Hello, Nick, he said as they stood up and dusted their oily overalls. Hello, they said as they ran to look at the car. They patted the bonnet and started to polish the sides. Poor Doris, they said. Poor Doris, are you all right? I see they still love the car, Philip laughed. The mechanics? Oh, they're as mad as March hairs about her. Polish, polish, rub, rub. They even sleep in her now. Yes, they do. Bring the blankets down and tuck themselves up in the back seat. What about you, young un? Did you have a visit from our old enemy, Oyen? Oh, yes. And she nearly got me. If you hadn't sent the cloud, well, I guess something was up. Now, come inside and tell me all about it. They all went into the parlour, and Philip told them the whole story. When he got to the bit where Oyen tried to get into the bedroom, Baby Bee was so scared that he hid under Mrs. Badger's apron. I expect she was angry, whispered Baby Bee, coming out from under the apron. Quite right, young beaver, said Mr. Edgar. She was angry. Uh, no wonder. Our friend Philip ruined her plans to get Beaver Tower. I don't suppose her master was too happy about that. Who is her master? Philip asked. The Prince of Darkness, young un, Mr. Edgar replied in a low voice. The Prince of Darkness. I'm surprised he didn't destroy Owen as soon as he found out she'd failed in her job. My guess is that he only let her go on one condition. The dark shadow seemed to pass across the room and everyone shivered. What condition? asked Philip. Well, no sense in keeping the truth from you, Mr. Edgar said, patting Philip's head. She's out to destroy you. She's been here and she's been to your home and she won't stop until she's found you. Where can I go? Philip managed to say at last. Go? said Mr. Edgar. Who said anything about going? You're staying here, of course, and there's evil about friends have to stick together. We've beaten Oyen once, and we can do it again. Hooray! shouted Baby Bee, sliding down Mrs. Badger's legs and running to Philip. I can help. I'm good at helping. First things first, Baby Bee, Mr. Edgar said. We've got to get organised. We'll need to have a proper warning if Oyen comes. And that's your job, Sergeant Robin. Fly off round the island and tell all the birds to keep a sharp lookout for trouble. The minute any of them notices anything strange, they must sound the alarm. The robin flew out of the door at once. The next thing, Mr. Edgar went on, is to get everyone in Beaver Towers. There's plenty of room, 
and we'll all be a lot safer here. Philip, Baby B, attention. Philip and Baby B got up and stood straight and still. You must go round the island telling everyone the plan. They must pack the things they need and be in beaver towers before the sun goes down this evening. Not a moment later, understand? Philip and Baby B nodded. Baby B had got better at running since the last time Philip had seen him. Philip could only keep up because the little beaver's legs sometimes went a bit too fast and tripped over themselves. Once Baby B fell down and sat waiting for Philip to catch up. As he got nearer, he could hear Baby B saying, Yes, yes, no, yes, no. What are you talking about? Philip asked, glad of a chance to sit down and have a rest. I'm doing my plants, Baby B replied. What does that mean? It's my lesson, of course. Mr. Stripe says I've got to do my plants every time I go out. Who's Mr. Stripe? He's a smelly old teacher, only he's not really smelly, only when he makes us do a million's work. But why do you say yes or no? Easy. If I can eat them, I say yes. But if they're poisonous, I say no. Look. Baby Bee pointed at some plants near Philip's feet. Yes, 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 no, yes. But they all look alike, Philip said. Baby Bee giggled. You are funny, Flipip. Bet you don't do very good in your tests at school. We don't have tests about plants. We only have tests about, well, geography and things. Come on, we'd better get going. What's geography? Baby Bee asked, taking Philip's hand as they walked along. Oh, maps and things. Baby Bee didn't even know what a map was, so Philip told him. Baby Bee was very interested, and he said that Philip ought to make a map of the island. The more Philip thought about the idea, the better it seemed. A map could be very useful if they were planning things. They were walking along by the side of a stream, and Baby Bee told him that it was called the River Busy. Soon the trees ended, and the stream twisted and turned through the open fields. Philip could see three houses ahead of them at the edge of the sea. Come on, we got to jump, said Baby Bee. And he took some steps backwards. He put his head down and galloped towards the stream. The little beaver just cleared the water, but he hadn't realized how soft it was on the other side. He landed knee deep in mud and couldn't move his legs. Help! I'm all stuck up! He shouted. He tried to pull his legs out, but he lost his balance and fell face down in the mud. Philip jumped over the stream and pulled him out. Poo! Oh, it's all smelly! Baby Bee said. Trying to wipe the dirt off his face. Oh, drat! Look at my gungarees! If I go in the sea, it'll be better. Come on. Baby B ran off towards the houses, and Philip followed. Baby B knocked on the doors and shouted. Soon there were ten rabbits waiting in a circle to hear the news. Baby B flicked some mud off his whiskers and told them about Oyin coming. The rabbits dashed into their houses, and Philip could hear them shouting and banging as they got ready. Baby B ran down to the sea and stood in the shallows, washing his face and his dungarees. Philip looked out over the bay to the other part of the island and saw the waves crashing against the very high cliffs. Behind the cliffs, tall mountains stretched away into the distance. "Come on, Baby B!" he shouted, and then saw the big wave tearing towards the shore. Philip didn't even have time to shout a warning. The wall of green water poured over the little beaver. The wave burst with a crash of white foam and swept up the beach. Philip peered anxiously as the water ran away. There was no sign of Baby B. Suddenly there was a big splash and Baby B leapt from under the water and dived towards another wave. "Hooray!" he shouted. "Look at me, Philip!" Philip was just going to call him back when he saw how well Baby B was swimming. Of course, beavers were expert swimmers. "I'll give you a race!" Baby B yelled and started swimming fast. Philip ran along the yellow sand, watching the young beaver dive and plunge through the waves like a large brown fish. Finally, Baby B came out of the sea and shook water all over him. "I'm best at swimming, can't I?" Baby B said. "You certainly are." Philip got a stick and wrote a big message in the sand. "What is it?" Baby B asked. "It says, 'Baby B is the best swimmer in the world.'" Baby B giggled. Does it really say that, Flipip? Philip nodded and took hold of Baby B's paw. Come on, we'd better go and tell the others. There were some sheep standing in a field next to the beach. Baby B ran across and started to tell them the news, but they just went on munching grass. 
He jumped up and down and shouted, "Quick, quick! A wheelie's coming!" But the sheep wouldn't listen. What can we do, Flippip? Grandpa Edgar says you can't just organise sheep. They only do what they want, and these ones only want to eat grass. Well, we can't force them to come, Philip said. We've warned them, and that's all we can do. Come on, we'll go and tell the others. It took nearly two hours to go round all the houses. First, they went to the manor and told Baby Bee's mother and father. Then they went through the orchards and told some beavers who lived near the River Eager. Finally, they took the path back towards Beaver Towers. On the way, they stopped to tell some badgers who lived near Mrs. Badger's house. They all ran along the path and didn't stop until they were on the drawbridge of Beaver Towers. Philip could see all the animals standing in the courtyard. Mrs. Badger was fussing round, handing out steaming hot cups of tea and pieces of cake. That's everybody except the sheep, Mr. Edgar said when Philip and Baby Bee got into the courtyard. How long will they be? They won't come, Grandpa. Me and Flippip told them, but they didn't listen, would they, Flippip? Baby Bee said. Philip shook his head. Oh, those silly, stubborn sheep! Said Mr. Edgar. They never listen to good advice. He began to turn a large wheel. Chains clanked, and the drawbridge slowly started to rise. There was a loud boom as the bridge closed in the gateway. Everyone felt safe at Beaver Towers. There was a lot of singing and laughing as they arranged beds in the great hall. At last, tired and happy, everyone went to bed. The next morning, some of the older animals set off round the castle to check that all the doors and windows were safe. Mr. Edgar decided that the young ones had to go on with their lessons as usual, so one of the rooms was turned into a classroom. Philip was disappointed when he was told that he had to join the others for the lessons. But Mr. Edgar, he started to say, "No buts, young 'un," said Mr. Edgar. "You go to school at home, so you must go to school here." So Philip walked up the stairs to the classroom with Baby B. Drat. Said Baby B, "It's not fair." Philip sat next to Baby B. There were four other pupils: two young rabbits, a small badger, and Nick, the youngest hedgehog of the mechanics. Mr. Strike, the teacher, was a very old badger who had a deep, growly voice. "Right," growled Mr. Strike. "Lessons will go on as usual. First of all, we welcome a new animal.、Uh, I mean, a new boy. I expect Philip is a hard worker, so I must show him how hard we can work. First lesson is tracks. Open your books at page fifty-three. Philip opened his book and was amazed to see a page full of strange marks and splodges. Was this some kind of animal writing? Now, who knows number one? Asked Mr. Stripe. All the animals put up a paw. Yes, Baby B. Weasel said, Baby B. Very good. Number two. Fox said, one of the small rabbits, and he shivered at the thought. Excellent. Number three. Field mouse said, the badger. Very good. Number four. Philip, you have a go. Said Mr. Stripe, pointing at him. Philip peered at the funny marks. I'm very sorry, Mr. Stripe, but I don't know this sort of writing. All the animals started to giggle. I beg your pardon, Mr. Stripe said. And、his voice was even more growly than before. I'm afraid I do not like silliness in my lesson. Now answer the question. Philip could feel a blush creeping up his neck and his face. He didn't know what to say, and he was very glad when Baby B started to speak. Please, sir, Mr. Stripe, Philip isn't being silliness. He doesn't do tracks and plants at his school, but he does geography and everything. And he's going to do a map of the island, aren't you, Philip? At maps. Said Philip, "He's right, Mr. Stripe. I don't even know what tracks means. I- is it like footprints? I mean, paw prints?" "I bet, I suppose," said Mr. Stripe. "But much more difficult than that. Tracks are marks left when an animal brushes past a, a rock or a tree or a bush. Never mind. Just pay attention and try to learn as much as you can." Philip tried and tried, but all the marks still looked like strange splodges. I was amazed at how clever Baby B and the others were. The lesson about plants was a bit easier. At the end of the lesson, there was a test. All of the animals got their answers right. Then it was Philip's turn. Mr. Stripe held up two plants and asked Philip to name them. He looked carefully at the leaves and flowers, then said, "That's cow parsley, and that's fool's parsley." Everyone clapped their paws, and Philip felt proud. It was the first thing he got right all morning. Mr. Stripe gave him a gentle pat on the back and said, "Well done." 
That was the end of school for the day. Philip and Baby Bee rushed off to see Mr. Edgar. They found him in the library, talking to the robin. Hello, you two whippersnappers, said Mr. Edgar. Sergeant Robin's just been round the island. No sign of Owen yet, so we're safe for a while. The minute they see her coming, all the birds are going to fly up into the air to warn us. That's right, isn't it, Sergeant? The robin bobbed and whistled as if to say, yes. Philip and Baby Bee sat on the floor next to Mr. Edgar's chair and told him about the morning's lessons. Mr. Edgar laughed gently when Philip told him he found the work very hard. I bet my old grey whiskers you can read and write better than any of them, even dear old Mr. Stripe. We animals find that very hard. You can read and write, though, can't you, Mr. Edgar? Indeed I can, but my father taught me how, and I'm starting to teach Baby B. He knows some letters, don't you? Baby B nodded. Hey, briefly, see D, me, half, and all, and all the others. But I want to learn Max. Flip, it's going to do a Mac. He means map, Philip said, and he began to explain the idea to Mr. Edgar. What a topping plan, Mr. Edgar said when Philip had finished. It could help us a lot against Owen. The only trouble is, said Philip, I haven't seen all the island. Do you think, well, Baby B and I were thinking, perhaps you could send for the kite in the cloud. If we could just fly around the island quickly, I could remember everything. Oh, no, young un, you're not going out there. Oh, please, we wouldn't be long, Philip begged. And the robin says Owen hasn't come. Oh, please, and you said a map could help us. At last, Mr. Edgar agreed. He picked up his book of magic and said a few words of the spell. They went down into the courtyard. In a couple of minutes, there was a rushing of wind, and the dragon kite and the cloud flew down from the sky. Mr. Edgar lifted Baby B up and put him on Philip's shoulder. Philip took hold of the kite. Now take care, said Mr. Edgar. Hold on tight, Baby B, and remember, I want you both back here in half an hour. No longer, promise? We promise. They shouted as the kite started to rise. Mr. Edgar went upstairs to the library. Finally, he opened the window and looked out towards the forest. Something in his bones was making him feel uneasy. He wished he could see the kite, but there was no sign of it. He stared and stared. He was still staring when there came the rushing sound of wings. From every tree and bush in the forest, birds were flying into the sky. It was the alarm signal. Oyen was coming. Wee! Shouted Baby B right into Philip's ear. We're as highest as anything, isn't it? Don't jump about so much, or you'll fall off. Philip managed to say, though the little beaver had his paw half over Philip's mouth. They were over the mountains. Philip could see the coast on the west side of the island. There was tall, rocky cliffs that plunged straight into the blue sea. The little cloud suddenly turned inland and danced higher into the sky. The kite wiggled its long tail and followed. Soon they were flying over the tall chimneys of the manor. That's where I live," said Baby B. "I know," Philip replied. "And look at the orchards. All the trees are in straight lines. You can see everything much better up here, can't you?" Philip saw the sheep. They looked like six balls of cotton wool, and they were running across the fields toward the forest. That's strange. Thought Philip, they look as if they're scared. I wonder why. The next minute he knew. First there was a loud screaming noise. He turned and looked. Thousands of seagulls were flying up from the small island just off the coast. Then came a burst of wings and bird song from below. Every bird on the island was climbing into the sky, and the air was filled with their cries of alarm. Suddenly the noise stopped. The birds dived towards the ground and disappeared into the trees. Philip looked down. Is it Oyen? Whispered a frightened voice next to Philip's ear. It's just the alarm signal, Baby B. Don't worry. We'll tell the kite to take us home. But no matter how loudly Philip shouted, "Take us back to Beaver Towers!" the kite did not change direction. Please, Cloud. Please, kite. Take us home! Shouted Philip. Nothing happened. They passed over some more fields and orchards. Then, at last, the kite turned west again. They were heading back to the castle. Another five minutes, and we'll be home, Baby B. Philip shouted. Look, we're going to fly along the river Eager, across the forest, and then back to good old Beaver Towers. There was no reply. What's the matter, Baby B? No reply. Philip twisted his head. The little beaver was staring out towards the sea. 
His eyes were wide open with fear. A moment later, Philip saw what Baby B was looking at. High above the sea, an enormous black bird was hovering in the sky. He was looking down at them. Yellow and green fire shone in the cruel eyes. Needles of light flashed from its long, sharp claws. For nearly a minute, the giant bird seemed to hang there. Then, tucked its wings behind its body and fell towards them like a huge rock. Faster and faster it came, nearer and nearer, bigger and bigger. And as it fell, it started to blur. The black wings changed into a flapping cloak. The claws turned to long, bony fingers. The beak became a pointed nose. It was Oyin. Her horrible mouth opened, and the sky was filled with a terrible scream. Philip saw her sharp fingernail stretch towards his face. He closed his eyes. There was a jerk, and he felt the kite rush upwards. He opened his eyes, but he couldn't see. For a moment, he wondered if Oyin's nails had ripped into him. Then he realized that his eyes were being pressed by warm, furry paws. I can't see, Baby B! He shouted. Sorry, said Baby B as he lifted his paws. I think we was falling. Philip felt the paws grab his ears instead. Not my ears, Baby B, round my neck. Sorry. Philip looked down. Owen was rushing up again, nearer and nearer. At the last moment, the kite tipped forward and dived. Owen made a grab for him, but they shot past her too quickly. Help! Squeaked Baby B as the kite tumbled. Ooh! Moaned Baby B as the kite twisted and climbed back into the sky. Help! Flippy's millions wobbly up here. All right, try to climb down quick before Owen comes. Philip held onto the kite with one hand and reached up for Baby B. The little beaver wriggled and slid his way down into the safety of Philip's arms. Hold tight! Here comes Oyun again! Yelled Philip, dodging and climbing, twisting and diving. The cloud and the kite sped through the air. Each time Oyun attacked, Philip was sure she would catch them. But each time, the kite did a little whirl or skip or spin and danced them away from the witch's hands. Each time she missed. Baby B hugged Philip tighter and shouted, "Hooray!" Philip was just beginning to enjoy the wild helter skelter rides when the kite shook. He looked up and saw the long dragon tail flying away by itself. Oyun had pulled it off as she had flown past. The kite wobbled like a seesaw. Oyun was diving again. The little round cloud started to rise. The kite twitched and tried to follow, but it couldn't. It couldn't fly properly without its tail. It started to fall faster and faster. It went spinning towards the ground. Philip could see the forest coming closer and closer. The kite tipped as it knocked into a tree. There was a loud ripping sound, and they jerked to a stop. The kite was caught on a branch. The ground was still a long way below, but they couldn't just hang there waiting for Oyun to come. Hold on tight, Baby B. We've got to jump. Philip gripped Baby B, aimed himself at a clump of ferns below, then let go of the kite. He closed his eyes and hoped. Philip expected a bump as they hit the ground. Instead, there was a rustle as they fell through the ferns. Then a splash. Cold water closed over them. They had fallen into the river Eager. It was deep but narrow. The ferns grew so close on each bank that they formed a long green tunnel over the river. They swam to the side and hung onto a tree root that stuck out from the bank. Baby B was just about to say something when there was a hideous scream. Through the ferns, they could just see Oyun. She was sitting on the branch next to the kite. Oyun jumped from the branch and flew down to the ground. They could hear her crashing through the bushes, searching for them. The bank shook as she passed. Then there was silence. We must get away before she comes back," whispered Philip. "I think it's best to stay in the water, but we must be careful not to make noisy splashes." If we go under the water, it's the bestest. Well, I can't swim very far like that. Hold my leg, Baby B whispered. Philip got hold of Baby B's leg, took a deep breath, and dived. The little beaver's flat tail beat fast, and they began to move. Philip helped as much as possible by swimming with his free arm, but Baby B did most of the work. They glided through the water until Philip couldn't hold his breath any longer. 
He tapped Baby B on the shoulder, and they swam to the surface. Philip took a breath, and down they went again. When they came up the next time, the river bank was not so high, and the ferns no longer hid them. Oh, it's too hard enough work. I can't swim in any more. Puffed Baby B. They climbed out of the river quietly and looked around. Baby B twitched his nose. Can you smell Obion? Philip asked. Baby B nodded. Then we better find somewhere to hide until she goes away. I know a place. Come on. Baby B grabbed Philip's arm, and they ran quickly but quietly through the trees. Then Baby B ducked down and crawled into some ferns. Philip followed him. Under the cover of the ferns was an old hollow log. They crawled inside and lay huddled up together. The time passed slowly. Baby B curled up and went to sleep. Twice Philip heard a terrible shrieking sound coming from a long way away. Owen must still be looking for them. Bit by bit it grew darker. In a few minutes he would wake Baby B and they would start the journey through the forest. First he would check that it was safe. He crawled out of the log and peered through the ferns. That was strange. It wasn't as dark as he'd thought. In fact, it seemed to be getting lighter. He stood up and saw a yellow red glow in the sky. What was happening? Could the sun still be shining? Perhaps it was the light from Beaver Towers. Then, against the glow of the sky, he saw the black shape of Oyen. He ducked back into the ferns and watched. She flew low across the forest and dived behind some trees. A moment later, she flew up again. Suddenly, the trees burst into flames. She was setting fire to the forest. There was a coughing sound from inside the log. Baby B came crawling out. Help, Flipip! It's all smoky in there. Shh! It's Oyen. She started fires everywhere. There was a horrible cackling laugh. They looked up and saw Oyen flying above the trees. Her evil face was lit by the flames. Burn! Burn! She screamed in delight. She clapped her hands, and at once a wind began to blow. The flames grew longer and stretched from tree to tree. In every direction Philip looked, the forest was on fire. A burning tree crashed to the ground near them. Hot sparks jumped into the air and fell down through the ferns. Help! I'm being all toasted! Yelled Baby B as he shook the sparks off his fur. Come on, flip it! Let's run! No, Philip said, pulling Baby B back. The fire's all round us. There's nowhere to run. Look, she's up there, just waiting to spot us. Another tree creaked and slowly fell down in a mass of flames. Then, above the cackling and roaring of the fire, came another noise. It was the sound of terrified sheep. <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly, Philip saw them. The poor things were running through the fire in a terrible panic. Their wool was singed, and they were dashing around madly, trying to find a way to safety. Sheep, sheep, over here! Shouted Philip and Baby B. But the sheep didn't hear. They charged off in another direction and were hidden by the smoke. Philip and Baby B waited a few minutes. Then Philip decided they'd better get back into the log. They crawled in and sat side by side. Flip it, Baby B said in a quiet, scared voice. Is all of them sheep in the fire? Baby B looked so worried that Philip took hold of his paw and said cheerfully, "No, I bet they found a way out. You know those sheep probably charged right out of the forest." Baby B nodded and tried to smile, but suddenly big tears rolled down his furry face. I want my mummy," he sobbed. "Shush, baby B, don't worry, we'll be all right," Philip said, squeezing his little paw tighter for comfort. He tried to make his voice sound brave, but he was really very scared. What could they do? Baby B must have seen how scared Philip was. "We're never going to get out," he cried, "and we'll be all burnt up like toast. Oh, help!" Tears fell off his fur like rain. And he started to rock to and fro in misery. In fact, he rocked so hard that the whole log started to move. Philip was just going to tell him to stop when he had an idea. He started moving in time with Baby B. The log rolled back and forth faster and faster, and then finally turned right over. 
Look out! It's Ho Yin! Screamed Baby B in shock. No, it's not, Philip said, and he hugged Baby B to stop him being scared. It was us. We did it. This log is round. It rolled over just like a wheel. If we rock hard enough, we can make it turn. And once it's turning, we can keep it going by rolling along inside. We'll just roll right through the fire, and the flames won't be able to get at us. Well, where are we going? Asked Baby B as he wiped away his tears. To the river, of course, said Philip, and he patted him on the head. We'll be safe there. Hooray! Shouted Baby B. Right, said Philip. There's not a moment to lose. One, two, three, go! They rocked together, up and down, up and down. The log began to tip, to and fro, to and fro. Harder! Shouted Philip. The log rocked faster and faster, higher and higher. Suddenly it rolled. Philip felt himself turn right over. Now keep going! He yelled to Baby B. And the two of them rolled over and over, and the more they rolled, the faster the log rolled. It was working. They were rolling across the ground like a huge pencil. There was a terrific splash, and a rush of water ran into the log. They'd done it. They were in the river. Soon, Philip found that the water was shallow enough for him to stand up. He put Baby B on his shoulders and walked slowly up the river in the darkness. At last. They rounded a bend and saw Beaver Towers standing high on the rock. They climbed out of the water and ran along the path at the edge of the forest. There was no sign of Owen. Philip took hold of Baby B's paw and they raced up the drawbridge. Open up! He called. Is that you, Baby B? Asked the voice. Yes, yes, it's me, and it's Flip it quick. Open the bridge. There was a grinding noise, then a creak. The bridge. Started to come down. At the same moment, they heard something crashing through the forest behind them. They turned and stared in fright. The bushes near them shook, and then, out of the moonlight, charged six black shapes. Help! It's Growlers! Squealed Baby B, and he jumped into Philip's arms. Ah! Ah! Said the six black shapes. They were dirty. They were scared. They had lost most of their wool. But they were safe. Well, laughed Philip gently as he patted them. You finally decided to come to Beaver Towers after all. Baby B cheered, and the sheep went. Bah! Then they all ran across the bridge. Baby B was already asleep. Philip tried to talk, but he couldn't. Baby B's mother picked up her sleeping son and carried him into the castle. Mrs. Badger and Mr. Edgar helped Philip to his feet and walked him slowly to the door. He must go to sleep straight away," said Mrs. Badger. "Put him in the bedroom next to the library, Mr. Edgar. I'll heat up some broth." Mr. Edgar led Philip upstairs to a room where two beds had been made up. Baby B was already tucked up in one of them. His mother was stroking his head. Baby B's mother patted her son once more and tiptoed out of the room. Philip got undressed quickly and slipped into bed. "Well," said Mr. Edgar quietly. "Now." Tell me all about it. I'm itching to know. Philip lay back on the pillow and told Mr. Edgar everything. Mrs. Badger came in and gave him some delicious broth. Really, Mr. Edgar, you must let this boy get some sleep," she said. Mr. Edgar patted Philip's head and winked. "Sleep tight," he said. "I'm off to the library to see if I can find a magic spell to stop the fire." "Good night." "Good night," Philip said. Mrs. Badger gave him a little kiss. And turned the lamp down even lower. Then she and Mr. Edgar tiptoed out of the room. The next minute, he was fast asleep. When Philip awoke, it was pouring with rain. He got up and looked out of the window. Some smoke was still drifting up from the forest, but there were no flames. The fire was out. Mr. Edgar must have made some magic to bring the rain. Philip started to get dressed, and Baby B woke up. Hello, Flipip. Oh, I'm starving," he said, jumping out of bed and giving himself a shake. Philip was hungry too. He helped Baby B put on his dungarees. Then they started downstairs. There was a large notice hanging from the handle of the library door. It said, "Do not disturb. Magic spells are being done." Baby B climbed onto the banister and slid down to the bottom of the stairs. They rushed into the dining hall and started eating breakfast. 
Baby B drank four big mugs of milk and ate seven slices of bread and jam. As soon as all the animals had finished eating, they came over to Philip and Baby B and asked questions. What was Owen like? How had they escaped on the kite? How did they get out of the fire? Mr. Stripe reminded the young ones at school begin as usual in five minutes. Me and Flipbit don't have to come, do we? said Baby B a bit cheekily. You most certainly do. And don't you go getting too big for your boots, Mr. Stripe says sternly, looking at Philip as well as Baby B. Now, go outside and tell Nick to come in. I expect the young rascal is already cleaning that beloved car, Doris. Mr. Stripe started up the stairs to the classroom, and Philip and Baby B went into the courtyard. Sure enough, the mechanics were there, looking after Doris. Mick was holding an umbrella over her bonnet to keep the rain off, while Anne and Nick were polishing as hard as they could. Come on, Nick, called Baby B. We've got to go to smelly school. Usually Nick never wanted to leave Doris, but today he rushed up to Baby B and started to talk about Owen and the kite and the fire. Mr. Stripe said Philip could spend the time drawing a map of the island, and he gave him some paper and some coloured pencils. Nick sat next to Baby B, and Philip could hear them whispering all through the lessons on plants. Philip worked hard on the map. He tried to remember where everything was. Bit by bit, it looked more and more like a real map. All the important things were there the mountains, the rivers, the houses, the forest. He even drew the field where he'd first seen the sheep. The map took all morning to do. When school finished, Philip wanted to show the map to Mr. Edgar, but the do not disturb sign was still on the library door. He sat next to Baby B and Nick at lunch. The two of them were still talking about Owen. Baby B seemed to have forgotten how dangerous and scaring it had all been. He just talked as if it had been good fun. Where do you think Owen is now? asked Nick. Philip said he didn't know, but Baby B said, I think she lives in Round Rock Island. I bet me and Flipip can go there on a boat, and then we can catch her and everything. Oh, can I come too? Nick said to Philip. He can, can't he? Baby B said, bouncing up and down. He bounced so hard that he knocked his plate. Some peas and two pieces of carrot flew through the air and hit Mr. Stripe, who was sitting at the next table. Baby B, stop being a nuisance, growled Mr. Stripe. Philip made Baby B and Nick finish their lunch quickly. Then he led them outside. It was still raining, but Mick and Anne were still in the courtyard polishing Doris. I know. Let's go on the wall to look for Owen, said Baby B. Don't you want to polish Doris, Nick? Philip asked. No, polishing's boring. I want to go with Baby B, said the little hedgehog. Well, all right, Philip said, but be careful on the wall. No leaning over the edge. Baby B and Nick ran across the courtyard and up the steps. Philip watched them as they looked over the wall. He could see them pointing and talking. They seemed happy, and they weren't doing anything silly, so Philip decided to go inside out of the rain. He meant to keep an eye on Baby B and Nick. But when he saw Mr. Edgar coming downstairs, he forgot all about them. It was only later that he realised what a big mistake he'd made. The dining hall was empty. Philip sat down at a table with Mr. Edgar. Drat me, but I'm tired. There was a time when I could do twenty magic spells a day, but nowadays I'm tired out after just one. Mind you, weather spells are a bit trickier than most. Did you send the ring? Said the old beaver, looking towards the window. Good idea. What? Put the fire out, all right. Trouble is, it was only meant to rain for an hour. You mean you can't stop it? Asked Philip. Mister Edgar shook his old grey head. I'm afraid not. That's why I've been up in the library so long. I thought I must have made the spell too strong. It happens sometimes with magic. Anyway, I looked in all the books, but I just couldn't find out what had gone wrong. And then it came to me in a flash. What said Philip? Earth, air, fire, water said Mr. Edgar. Then he looked at Philip and added in a whisper, "My spell has been taken over by Owen. I can't stop the rain because she's put a stronger spell on it." Why would Owen want to make it go on raining, Mr. Edgar? He asked. I told you, earth, air, fire, water, the four elements. Well, what are they? The oldest magic there is. Everything in the world is made from them. Plants, for example, they grow out of the earth and they need the fire of the sun, water from the sky, and good clean air. 
Even newfangled things like that useless car, Doris. The metal she's made of comes from the earth and has to be melted down by fire. My guess is that the Prince of Darkness has given Oyen four chances to destroy you. Her first attack was by the tunnel she made in the earth. The second was in the air when you were with the kite. The third was by fire in the forest. Her last chance is water. A blast of wind blew the rain hard against the window. Well, said Philip, she didn't get me with the other ways. What happens if she doesn't get me with water? Then the spell will be broken. She's been given four chances. If she doesn't destroy you, the Prince of Darkness will destroy her. Mr. Edgar smiled. Cheer up, young'un. Just one more attack. If you can survive that, we can say goodbye to that old horror Oyen forever. They were both listening to the howl of the wind and the splash of the rain when they heard something else. From the courtyard came the sound of a scream. They rushed outside and saw Baby Bee's mother running down the steps from the castle wall. Baby Bee! she gasped. He's gone! Before she could say anything else, the two hedgehogs, Anne and Mick, ran up shouting, Nick! Has anyone seen Nick? They were on the wall, Philip said. They're not there now. I've just looked. I've been everywhere. Oh, Mr. Edgar, what are we going to do? asked Baby Bee's mother. Now, don't panic. They can't have gone far. Let's look inside. Philip was the one who saw the wet paw prints. They started by the main door, went across the tiled floor and up the main stairs. That's them, Mr. Edgar said. Those young rascals never bother to wipe their paws. Philip and I will follow the prints and find them. Philip raced across the stairs ahead of Mr. Edgar. The tracks ran along the corridor and into the library. He opened the door. The paw prints led across the library floor to the bookcases. But Baby B and Nick weren't in the room. Philip was just thinking that they must have gone into another room when he remembered the secret passage. He had used the passage to get into Beaver Towers when the Growlers were living there. He ran to the bookcase and pulled. Slowly the bookcase opened like a door. Behind it were the steep stone stairs that led down to the tunnel. On each of the steps were wet paw prints. Found them? asked Mr. Edgar as he came through the library door. Oh, Mr. Edgar, they've gone down the secret passage. Look, you can see their paw prints. Drat me, what on earth are those two madcaps up to? asked Mr. Edgar. Don't they realise the danger? That's just it, Philip said. Baby B and Nick were talking all morning. Nick kept saying how brave Baby B was, and I think Baby B believed him. He thinks he can just walk up to Oyen and catch her. Stuff and nonsense, Mr. Edgar said. Oyen will tear them to pieces. Where could they have gone? Round Rock Island, Philip said. What? thundered Mr. Edgar. Yes, I'm sure of it. Baby B thinks Oyen is hiding there. He said he would go there and fight her. Oh, my hat! He's not going to swim there, surely? No, he said something about a boat. Can you show me where the boat is, Mr. Edgar? Philip asked, pulling the map out of his pocket. Mr. Edgar peered at the map and then pointed to the three houses where the rabbits lived. Just here, where the river busy runs into the sea. The rabbits kept it as a little shed next to their house. It's only a small boat and it's never been used for years. Philip looked at the map. Baby B and Nick must have started at least 15 minutes before. He'd never be able to catch them up, but he must do something. He pointed to the map. Look, Mr. Edgar, if they're going to try to sail to Round Rock Island, they'll have to go along the coast. If I run very fast, I can probably reach the beach opposite the island about the same time as they do. Perhaps I'll be able to call them and make them come back. Hold on, young'un. That could be just what Oyen's waiting for. Remember, her last attack will be by water. And she'll be desperate. She knows what'll happen if she fails. But if I don't go, she'll attack Baby B and Nick. I must go. Mr. Edgar took Philip's hand and looked him in the eye. You know what, said the old beaver. You're just about one of the bravest young animals it's been my good fortune to meet. Now, get cracking. And just one piece of advice. This will be Oyen's worst attack. But there's a reason she's left it to last. She hates water. She's made up of air and fire. Water is her deadly enemy. In fact, she hates it so much that she won't even want to come out in this rain she's made. Philip felt its heart begin to pound. He grabbed a torch off the wall. Goodbye, he called to Mr. Edgar. Good luck, young'un. Philip held the flaming torch up high and started down the stairs. The dark tunnel went on and on. 
The light of the torch didn't shine very far, and the shadows jumped in a very scaring way. Philip was glad when he reached the steps at the end. The rain hit him in the face as he came out, and the wind nearly knocked him over. He put his head down and ran along the path through the forest. Already his clothes were soaking wet. Still, I mustn't mind the rain, he thought. If Mr. Edgar's right, it means that Oyim won't want to come out while it's wet. A second later, the rain stopped. Philip stood still. It was as though Oyim had read his mind. She must know that he's left the safety of Beaver Towers. She'd stop the rain so that she could leave her hiding place and come to look for him. Huge black clouds were racing across the sky, driven by the wind. Suddenly he was very scared. He felt the wind push him in the back. It wanted him to go towards the sea. It blew harder, and he began to move. Soon he was running, and he couldn't stop. Oyen's wind wouldn't let him. Like it or not, he was being blown towards the sea. He passed the path that led to Mrs. Badger's house. He passed the end of the forest. The wind chased him across the open fields. His legs pounded on and on. Now he could hear the roar of the sea. He reached the top of a small hill and fell down onto the golden sand. He lay on the beach. At last he was out of the wind. He sat up and tried to get his breath back. Huge waves were crashing onto the sand. Philip screwed up his eyes and looked out across the angry sea. There was Round Rock Island. Waves were bursting against it, almost covering it with white foam. The wind, the waves, it was all part of Oyen's trap. And Oyen's wind had blown him into it like a fly into a spider's web. And where was Baby B and Nick? He couldn't see a boat. The wind whistled and roared. The waves broke with a boom. Then, very faintly, he heard it. A tiny, far away cry for help. He stood up and looked. He caught a glimpse of something out in the sea, but then it was hidden by a big wave. There it was again. It rose up on the side of another wave, and he saw it clearly a small boat, and Baby B and Nick were in it. Baby B! Nick! he called as he ran down to the edge of the water. Slip it! Help! Baby B shouted across the roaring sea. The boat looked so tiny. Each time a wave hit it, Philip was scared it might turn right over. The two little animals were hanging onto the mast as hard as they could. But in fact, the wind and waves were helping because the boat was coming nearer and nearer the shore. Philip waded out into the sea as far as he could. Waves rose and crashed down on him. He could feel the sea pulling at his legs, trying to knock him over. The boat came nearer. Another minute, and he would be able to grab it and pull it to land. Nearer and nearer. A huge wave rolled in. It caught the boat and swished it towards him. He reached out and got hold of the side. At once, he started to pull it. He pulled and pulled, but the boat didn't seem to move. Surely he must be getting nearer the land, and yet when he looked, the beach seemed further away. Yes, it was. The water was getting deeper. He wasn't pulling the boat. The boat was pulling him. His feet could no longer touch the bottom. The wind had changed. The boat was rushing out to sea, and he was going with it. Suddenly, above the noise of the wind and sea, he heard another noise. It was a horrible cackling laugh of Oyen. He looked up and saw her. She was flapping her cloak. Each time she flapped it, the wind blew, and each time the wind blew, the boat was carried further and further out to sea. The little boat sped away from the shore, rocking like mad. Philip clung on tight as waves burst over him. The water was cold, and he could feel his fingers slipping. Quick, Philip, get in! Baby B shouted. Philip took a deep breath and slowly lifted his leg until he got it over the side. The boat tipped and nearly turned over, but he slid his body up into the edge. The next minute, he was lying in the bottom of the boat with Baby B and Nick rolling around on top of him. A giant wave crashed against the boat. Water poured onto them, and they tumbled and splashed and bumped into each other. He grabbed Baby B and Nick and dragged them to the seat at the back of the boat. They huddled together for warmth and looked up at Oyen. She pointed a long, bony finger at them and laughed. Blow wind! She suddenly screamed. Take them to the island and smash them on the rocks. She flapped her cloak, and the wind filled the sail. The boat raced towards Round Rock Island. 
Philip could see the huge waves crashing against the cliffs. In a minute, one of those waves would catch the boat. It would hurl them onto a rock and smash them to little pieces. What are we going to do? Shivered Baby Bee. Philip shook his head. What could they do? If only he had a knife to cut the rope that held the sail. If they could get rid of the sail, the wind wouldn't be able to push them nearer the island. Then he had an idea. Baby B, is it true that beavers can cut down trees with their teeth? He asked. Not very big ones, but only little ones, said Baby B. Do you think you can cut this rope? Easy, said Baby B. He bent down and started biting the rope. The boat was getting nearer the cliffs. Hurry up! Shouted Nick as he grabbed the other side of the rope and started biting too. Ouch! Your prickles are pricking my nose," said Baby B. "Sorry," said Nick, and he got hold of the end of the rope and pulled instead. Baby B gave one more bite and the rope broke. The wind caught the canvas and lifted it. The sail tore away from the mast and went flying into the air. The rope went with it, and Nick went with the rope. He'd forgotten to let go of the end. Philip and Baby B could hear the little hedgehog squealing as he was carried away. Oh, Philip! Cried Baby B. Nick can't swim. There was nothing they could do. Now that the sail was gone, the boat had stopped rushing forwards to the cliffs. But it also meant that there was no way they could get to Nick. Curse you! Oyen screamed. She raised her hands, and lightning flashed from her fingertips. Philip grabbed Baby B and threw himself to the front of the boat. The lightning hit the place where they'd been standing. The wooden floor cracked and water began to pour in. If Oyen made another hole like that, the boat would sink in less than a minute. There was only one hope: perhaps he could trick her. He stood up and laughed. Oyen looked surprised. "Go on, send your lightning!" Philip shouted. "What a stupid witch you are! You can't win with magic. You couldn't get me by earth or air or fire, and you won't get me by water. I've got a magic chain round my neck to stop you." It's more powerful than any magic of yours. You can't hurt me while I've got it. There was a long moment while Oyen stared at him. Philip stared back. Would she believe him? He put one hand near his throat and pretended to touch something there. So, silly Oyen, while I've got it round my neck, you can't hurt me. Go back and tell the Prince of Darkness that you've failed again. A look of fear crossed Oyen's hideous face. Then. She let out a scream and dived. Philip moved to the edge of the boat. Oyen flew nearer. She had believed him. Her crooked hands stretched towards his neck. Philip stood still. He wanted to duck out of the way of those terrible hands. He wanted to hide from that terrible face. But he stood still. Her fingernails scratched his neck. Philip reached up and grabbed her arms. He held them tight and threw himself backwards. He saw the terror in Oyen's eyes as she realized what he was doing. A dreadful scream came from her ugly mouth as they both fell into the sea. Water was her deadly enemy. Philip felt his hands burning. The sea bubbled and steamed. Oyen's arms jerked and pulled, but Philip held on. It was like fighting an octopus. He felt himself sinking deeper and deeper. Oyen's arms jerked one last time and then stopped moving. Philip let go of her and swam upwards. He came up by the side of the boat. Baby B helped him climb in. The sky was blue, the sun was shining, the wind had stopped and the sea was calm. Oyen's storm was over. Baby B wiped the water from Philip's face. Where did she gone, Flipip? The little beaver asked in a scared voice. I don't know," said Philip. They leaned over the side of the boat and looked. The water was very clear. And they could see almost to the bottom. They both gasped as they saw a black shape flapping upwards. She's coming again," said Baby B, and he held on to Philip's hand. The shape broke the surface. It was Oyen's cloak. It rolled over, and there was Oyen, white skull and white bones. Nothing else was left. The water had dissolved her. She was gone for good. The boat was still filling up with water. Philip took off his socks and rolled them into a ball. Then he pushed it as hard as he could into the hole that Oyen's lightning had made. 
A. B. was looking very sad, and Philip knew that he was thinking about how poor little Nick had been carried away on the sail. Philip took the oars and started rowing. It was slow work because the oars were heavy. Baby B. sat at the back of the boat, looking more and more miserable. Soon big tears began to roll down his furry cheeks. Philip felt sad too. He should have been happy because Oyen was dead and the danger was over. But he couldn't help thinking about Nick, and the more he thought about the friendly little hedgehog, the sadder he got. Philip's eyes filled with tears, and he couldn't see properly. What was that floating on the water? It looked like a big sheet. He wiped his eyes and stood up to get a better look. It was a sail, and there was something right in the middle of it, something that looked like a prickly ball. It was Nick. Nick. Nick! Shouted Philip, jumping up and down so much that the boat nearly tipped over. The prickly ball started to unroll. A sharp little nose peeped out. Two scared eyes blinked in surprise. Then four little paws started splashing across the wet sail towards the boat. As Nick ran, the soaking sail finally started to sink. The little hedgehog splashed for a moment and then disappeared under the water. Quick, baby B! Philip yelled. Baby B didn't need telling twice. He jumped out of the boat and dived under the waves. Some bubbles came up, and then Baby B appeared, holding Nick in his paws. Philip pulled them both out. Baby B shook his fur, and Nick wiggled his spines. He started to laugh, and Baby B and Nick joined in. They were still laughing when the boat finally slid into the golden sand. They jumped out and ran all the way to Beaver Towers. As they got near the castle, they could see all the animals standing on the walls. They stopped running. Let's tell them the good news," said Philip. "I'll count to three, and then we'll all shout." They took a deep breath. Philip counted to three, and then they shouted at the top of their voices, "Oyen is dead!" You should have heard the cheering and singing and the laughing. It went on until Philip, Baby B, and Nick got into the castle. It was still going on when everybody sat down to a huge feast in the evening. The great hall was filled with lights. And the tables were piled high with delicious food and drink. After the meal, they played games, and then it was time for the dancing. Philip had never seen a dance like it. Everybody got in a big circle and started clapping. Two by two, the animals rushed into the middle, bumped into each other, fell over, and ran back to join the circle. Everybody laughed and cheered, and it was so silly that Philip soon found himself laughing too. When his turn came, Philip ran into the middle with Baby B. They bumped and fell and laughed and laughed. The biggest laugh and the loudest cheer came when Mr. Edgar and Mrs. Badger bumped. Oh my hat! Laughed Mr. Edgar as he rolled on the floor. I'm getting too long in the tooth for this nonsense. I need a bit of a rest. Fancy some fresh air, young Philip? We could have a gin wag at the same time. Mr. Edgar led Philip out into the courtyard. Well, youngun, Mr. Edgar said softly. We've got to think about getting you home, and this time we'll make sure your mother and father don't ask awkward questions about where you've been. But they're bound to," said Philip. "I've been away even longer than last time. They won't even know you've been out of the house," Mr. Edgar said. "How? Magic, of course. Been rummaging in my old books, and I've found just the spell to do the trick. It'll pop you back to your bedroom a couple of minutes before your mother gets home from seeing." Uh, what was the lady's name? The one she went to see the night Oyen paid you a visit, Mrs. Jessop. That's the one. So, when your mother opens the door, she'll find you at home, just as if you've never been away. <laughs> Topping, eh? Philip gulped. Can you really do that, Mr. Edgar? Of course I can. The dancing had finished, and all the animals were sitting round the fire telling stories and jokes, and the story that they all wanted to hear again. Was about how Philip and Baby B and Nick had fought the dreaded witch Oyen. Philip told it, Nick told it, then it was Baby B's turn. The dangerous adventure was over. The fire glowed in the fireplace, and a soft song went on and on. Each animal was making his own sound. There were no words, but Philip knew what the song was about. It was about trees and winds, and the sun and sea, and most of all, it was about friends. And love.